Okay, up next, we're going to begin our um, healthcare panel, and our moderator is Wendy Edge. And Wendy Love Edge is a disabled survivor of the U.S. healthcare system and a retired occupational therapist trained at Boston University's <clears throat> prestigious Sergeant College after finding improved health and wellness with cannabis medicine and other so-called alternative health methods methods as well as positive lifestyle changes. She founded Bulldozer Health, a 501c3 nonprofit and healthcare reform initiative. Wendy is also an author, artist, and talk show host. And I'm going to just go ahead and add an amazing individual. Oh. And I am so pleased to be working with you. And uh, I believe you bring a giant wealth to our mission and to the Walk for Change and to Humanity's health in general. I'll let you have it. Wendy Love Edge. Oh, thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Um, what a fantastic event this is. My goodness. I'm so excited to be here and uh, working with the Walk for Change. This today is going to be a health panel. And um, I'm just kind of looking to see if the guests are in yet. I don't, I don't see anyone. So I'll just keep talking. Um, so I founded Bulldozer Health. Um, our mission is to, oh, there they are. <laughs> Hello. Um, all right, so um, I do have some guests here. I'm really excited to see them. Let me make sure I've got everybody. Um, all right. So um, I, have, I have two inspirational health professionals with me today um, for this health panel. And I'm gonna get started with it actually because we're, we're time limited. So, um, so I wanna just kind of jump right in and I'm gonna introduce each of them and then give them about five minutes to talk a little bit about their projects. I know it's not a long time. Um, but then we have some questions we're going to discuss together as well. So firstly, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. David Rabin, MD, PhD, a board certified psychiatrist and neuroscientist. He is the co-founder and chief innovation officer at Apollo Neuroscience. In addition to his clinical psychiatry practice, Dr. Rabin is also the co-founder and executive director of the Board of Medicine and a psychedelic clinical researcher currently evaluating the mechanism of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in treatment resistant mental illnesses. Welcome, Dr. Rabin. Uh, Thank so you so much for having me. Oh, it's so great to see you again. And um, if you'd like to just speak a little bit about your projects, um, we'd love to hear about it. Sure. Um, so, as you, you know, thanks for the intro. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And share some of the knowledge from the latest in psychiatry and neuroscience with everyone. And I think it's no mystery that we are, you know, at a particular juncture in uh, US history where we're struggling to, struggling with a lot of mental health challenges, uh, particularly in the field of trauma and how we cope with stress, um, not only stress in a single event, but stress over time. Um, and we know, we all see that now, it's pretty undeniable given the nature of the current pandemic. Um, and chronic stress in particular has always been of interest to me and sort of why some of us cope positively and others as a, of us develop illness or have a lot of issues with result of chronic stress. And so I've been studying the science of this for almost 15 years now and uh, looking at all the different tools effectively that we have in our toolbox to be able to cope with stress more effectively and improve our ability to bounce back. Um, something that's really important and something that we call in, in neuroscience and biology uh, resilience. Um, which is really critical to the way that we function and really helping us just to try to figure out, you know, how do we see through all the, all the fogginess around us all the time to, to get a better sense of who we are and, and what our full potential really is. And Apollo Neuroscience is a technology that I developed at the University of Pittsburgh, which tries to make this kind of um, these kinds of strategies more accessible to the general public. So for people who have uh, never meditated or never successfully engaged in a deep breathing activity before um, and had relief, Apollo delivers gentle vibrations to the body through the skin that um, rapidly remind the body that it's safe, just like deep breathing, just like meditation or soothing touch. 
And by tapping into that pathway, it can help us cope with stress more effectively. So that's one of the technology applications that we have uh, adapted and it's now available. Um, we launched in January and we've had great success with kids and adults um, with trauma. And it's now in multiple clinical trials. And the Board of Medicine is a group of experts uh, at a nonprofit that I work on that focuses on delivering more non-invasive and risk-free treatments to the public, specifically focused around mental health, but with medicine in general, um, really focusing on helping educate not only clients and patients, but also doctors and care providers about plant medicine, how it can be used safely, what the historical and current evidence for this is, and how we can really do the best we can to deliver better holistic care to and sustainable care that's affordable to uh, a massive population in need. So thank you so much for having me, and I'm excited to be able to share this with the community. Absolutely. I love what you're talking about. It sounds great to me. Um, and we also have um, Nurse Jana Champagne with us. Um, Nurse Jana's introduction to the cannabis industry began as a cannabis patient who happens to be a nurse when she suffered a debilitating immune health collapse in 2012, for which she attributes cannabis for supporting her ability to regain her current optimal health status. Jana's daughter with autism has also received great benefit from medical oh. cannabis therapy. Um, since improving her Thank own you. and her daughter's health, Jana has worked with thousands of patients to help them optimize their health through an individualized approach, which has led to also teaching healthcare professionals to integrate cannabis into their own practice. Welcome, Nurse Jana. Nice to yeah. see you. Nice to see you, Wendy, and thank you for having me. Nice to meet you, Dr. Dave. Um, I'm so, so pleased to be here today and talking about advocacy in our healthcare system. And as you mentioned, I am a cannabis patient who happens to be a nurse, and I stumbled onto medical cannabis because of my own health issues um, and had such phenomenal results from the cannabis. I started researching and, and trying to figure how, how is it that this plant has done more for me than a year and a half of mainstream approaches that have left me disabled, unable to work. You know, with cannabis, I got functional very quickly. I was able to wean off of a lot of my pharmaceuticals. It actually kept me from going down the opioid pain medication pathway, which I attribute for saving my life, in addition to reversing my autoimmune condition. So it's done some just amazing things and anybody that's a medical professional watching this is hopefully gonna be, you know, uh, you know, that will get their attention because we have no answers in the mainstream medical approach that can reverse autoimmune. So it really does a lot of amazing things. And it, of course it has helped my daughter enormously as well. And so what I like to do is talk about you know, kind of the comparison between the mainstream approach and the medical cannabis approach. And, uh, you know, when we look at mainstream medicine, of course, we know that our, our medical system is so broken. As a nurse, I worked in acute care and, you know, I was in there passing medications to my patients every day and just seeing how poorly we were handling, especially chronic illness. You know, acute care, you have a heart attack, of course, you want to go to the hospital. For chronic illness, you know, our mainstream approach really does not have a lot of good answers for our patients, and they end up on pharmaceuticals and then more pharmaceuticals to, to manage the side effects of others. And one of the big downsides of pharmaceuticals is, is that they really don't have any potential to target the underlying cause of disease. I think, you know, most of them anyway, I think there's an exception maybe in antibiotics, but most of them are simply masking the symptoms or not really addressing what is causing the imbalances that cause disease. Where, um, you know, and the other thing about pharmaceuticals is that a lot of them are harmful. And we see this, you know, every hour of every day we lose a patient to opioid overdose, for example, yet it's freely allowed. So there's the mainstream paradigm. Um, and then with the cannabis paradigm, it's very different because we're actually, when we supplement with cannabis, we are providing vital nutrients to our bodies that are, are argued to be necessary for life. They're so vital that the most prolific source is human breast milk. So this tells you how much our bodies really require endocannabinoids. And what cannabinoids do is promote balance in our body. And when you consider that the underlying cause of every chronic illness is imbalances, every illness, chronic or acute, is imbalances, this really explains how cannabis works differently. It can really target those underlying imbalances and help promote what we call homeostasis, which is really your most, your most optimal uh, status that you can be in with your health. 
And so the other thing about cannabis is that it has this unsurpassed safety profile. We have utilized cannabis for more than 5,000 years in cultures around the world, it has never killed anybody. And so, you know, when you, when you hear this, this objective information about these different approaches, you have to kind of wonder why don't we use cannabis in our mainstream approach? And unfortunately, the answer to that is, is profit and political entanglement. Uh, with the pharmaceutical companies and, and not just pharmaceuticals either, but cannabis is actually a competitor for things like oil and gas and building materials and lumber and paper, many, many big industries. But the bottom line is that restricted access to cannabis is not in the best interest of patients. It's really in the best interest of corporate profits. And so, and you know, the current system really offers in the mainstream pills, tests, or surgery. And right we're talking about is getting at the root cause of illness. And exactly. so I can definitely relate to what you're talking about with my own experiences. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you for that introduction. Of course. Um, um, I, I, well, I have a few questions that I'd like to help us to stimulate some conversation. And um, I think I'd, I'd like to start actually um, with this first one. And you kind of already started talking about it. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll start in with, with Dr. Dave and then we'll come back to you again, if that's okay. Um, of course. So here's the question. It's clear that our current health system isn't working, uh, but fighting against it is often exhausting and unproductive, mm -hmm. right? So with your particular expertise in mind, please tell me or tell our, our viewers and listeners, um, what would be the key elements of a new system? Dr. Dave, if you could start, that would be great. Sure. Thanks for that question, Wendy. I really appreciate it. And I think that's a really important question that we tackle right now because I think for a long time, particularly as somebody who's been trained in Western medicine, and thank you, Jenna, for that summary of cannabis uh, medicine. That was awesome. Um, and I think there's just so much to talk about there because that's really a symbol of, of other problems that we have that are endemic to our health system. Um, I think it's really important to start out by saying that one of the biggest differences, one of the biggest issues that we have in the in the Western health system is that Western health puts itself as, as creates a hierarchy where it puts itself as better than other health practices, and the, and and, it, and it's better across the board, which is not exactly consistent with the way that medicine works. So the way that medicine works is that we try to provide, as Hippocrates often said, the medicine that suits the patient with the least amount of harm as possible. And the beginning of the Hippocratic Oath that we all take as physicians is first do no harm, then do everything else, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we are not respectful of that oath and, and the lineage and the history of medicine, then we're forgetting sort of what all of this practice of healing is based on. And that practice of healing is based on respecting every discipline of medicine for what it's good at. So the reason why this is particularly interesting when it comes to cannabis and natural medicines is that where we need to go from here is really looking at where Eastern and Western medicine meet, which is the convergence of plant medicine and psychedelics and traditional tribal and, and Eastern practices, Chinese medicine and, and uh, Ayurvedic medicine, with which is incredible and has proven itself to be incredible over the years at treating chronic inflammatory illnesses and preventing said illnesses, where, and that, that needs to meet with Western medicine, which has proven to be incredible at treating acute emergency illnesses. So again, we can talk about you know the deficits of Western medicine all we want, but when it really comes down to when you need to have your life saved from an immediate injury or an infection or something that is immediately going to take your life or risk harming you for an extended period of time, Western medicine is where it's at. And it is really done us an incredible service in terms of evolving the way that we've been able to provide care as a medical system in a community. That said, we just frankly suck with Western medicine at treating chronic illness. So, and, and as Jana said, it's because we're not getting to the root cause. And the reason why Eastern Western Eastern medicine is so fascinating and tribal medicine is it actually does in a lot of ways get to the root cause which is something that Western medicine is now gradually over time starting to come full circle and prove out some of these Eastern techniques and how they work. One of the examples, as Jana was saying, is imbalance, right? So imbalance in the nervous system, imbalance between different parts of the body, like our stress response and our recovery response is directly related to illness and what we call disease or dis-ease, right? So the lack of ease or the lack of wellness and health. And so, the, and I think the way that we need to look at medicine going into the future, 
in large part is not how is my practice of medicine better than your practice of medicine, but it's where do we meet in the middle? And where we meet in the middle is at this point, identifying treatments that are data-based, data-driven and evidence-based that can deliver as much help as possible to our patients in the way that we teach our patients how to heal themselves, which is the most sustainable way of health. And that's what Hippocrates talked about as well, and Maimonides and all the ancient physicians. And using that technique to deliver these treatments and these healing practices with as least side effects as possible. Cannabis being a perfect example of a medicine that works so well and other psychedelic medicines like MDMA and psilocybin, they work so well with just a few doses when delivered properly because they teach the, the client or the, or the patient how to actually work and heal themselves over time. And so I think that's really from the 10,000 foot view, that's how we see the way that we work with our patients and the way that we involve ourselves in the healthcare system is being able to gradually shift the way that we treat patients by actually helping them to learn skills about self-care. I love that. Um, I think, I think I loved everything you said, actually, um, you know, a system that is more patient driven that teaches people to be empowered in their health. Um, I love that. That's really kind of what you're talking about and making mm -hmm. sure that these treatments are, um, are reviewed and are actually scientifically based, and that's um, that's so important. So, Dr. Mary Clifton joined our panel. Thank, welcome. Um, I'll, I'll introduce you um, uh, mm -hmm. now since uh, we've already started. But I'm so delighted that you're here. Um, Mary Clifton, MD, is a board-certified licensed internal medicine doctor practicing in Manhattan. She's a recognized expert in CBD and cannabis and the founder of cbdandcannabisinfo.com and the highly respected professional certification course, The Cannabinoid Protocol. Um, uh, she provides specialized consultation on patient and provider education, telemedicine, and cannabinoids and has worked with several pharmaceutical CBD and cannabis corporations. Welcome to the panel, Dr. Clifton. Um, oh, thank you, Wendy. Um, so I, I asked the first question, and we're gonna go to Jana next, but just so you know what the question is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay, because, you can go to Dr. Mary next. She hasn't had a chance to talk yet. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, we'll go to Dr. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, thank you, Jana. I'm flexible. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is, it's, it's clear our current health system isn't working as is, but fighting against it is often exhausting and unproductive. With your particular expertise in mind, please tell us what would be key elements of a new health system. Boy, I don't know that I could have improved much on what Dr. Dave said. You know, it's true that, I, that my, my, uh, my, my feeling that medicine is really driven from the inside out with patient empowerment and giving people, giving, giving the patients the opportunity to control their health and, and control their wellness. The, and that's where cannabis and CBD are so powerful within that movement. I, uh, so so I, I'm, I, I love these uh, products for those reasons. And I think the most important thing we can do for our patients is give them education, you know, give them the information that they need to make educated decisions. So that's where the CBD and cannabis info comes in that all of those short videos are free and are available anytime you want yeah. to learn more about your underlying medical condition and uh, and get it taken care of you know without uh, if you need if you need like a, a, a somebody to you know have a consultation with you that's fine too but in a lot of cases people just need the power of the education to uh, to get to the next step in healing themselves. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so Nurse Jana, uh, you're next. Same question. Um, if you have anything you'd like to add or uh, please do. Sure, of course, of course. And, and I resonate with everything that has been said so far. I think education is so powerful, whether it be educating a patient and, and more recently I'm focused on trying to educate other medical professionals because I think it's so important that we reach as many patients as possible. And as, as one medical professional, you know, we're sort of limited in that capacity. Um, but another area I feel is so important um, when we're looking at, at the issues in our healthcare system and how broken it is, is that we're focused on solutions and not on the problem. And, you know, there's a lot of, of issues happening in our society today, and there's a lot of anti, anti, anti protest movements. And from my perspective, that, that feeds the problem because where focus goes and Close, correct. And so my approach personally 
is to focus on the solution and be pro solution. So what is what is a viable solution to our current healthcare system and the status of it being so overwhelmingly broken? You know, we have healthcare providers who are, you know, we have this planned exodus following COVID where so many are leaving the hospital systems because of the trauma that they have experienced themselves. And so I really see cannabis once again being a huge answer there that we can offer to these medical professionals for their anxiety. You know, we can tell them the research that shows, you know, cannabis use during the trauma actually can prevent PTSD happening after the fact. And then we can get their interest in sharing our stories and sharing the research and sharing that it doesn't mean schedule one placement. There's so many little of these, you know, elevator tidbits that I've been trying to put together. There's more in the room. I haven't brought over there. Professionals. So that's yeah. one of the things yeah. I'm doing it, it, trying to contribute to a solution to all that is wrong in our healthcare system right now. Yeah, I love that. And and you mentioned a couple of things that are really important to do that, like taking cannabis out of Schedule One. Um, mm -hmm. That's so important um, to being able to add that as a treatment modality to the whole system. Um, but uh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, if, any, if anyone has anything else they'd like to add, please do. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next question. All right. So the next question is about trauma. Uh, trauma has reached pandemic proportions really some time ago and can be the root of many problems. From your point of view, how can we most effectively tackle this issue and its resultant health problems? Dr. Dave, if you'd like to start, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I think we touched on this a little bit already, but trauma is an incredibly difficult issue to deal with um, in general. I mean, for the for a long time, it's been heavily stigmatized in American culture in particular, um, and Western culture in general, more generally. I think we we have been taught for a long time to suck it up, for lack of a better term, and this is commonly use still in, you know, I, I can say from my training in medical school, it's discouraged to admit mental health issues or depression or anxiety. Same with the military, same with a lot of our major institutions that we have, um, which kind of sets a tone, right? That trauma is not okay to talk about. But I think when we really break down what trauma is, which is now in a lot of ways an undeniable phenomena that's going around the world because of the current situation we're in, you know, what trauma really is, is one or multiple powerful, meaningful, negative experiences over time. And these one or multiple powerful, negative, meaningful experience over time can't exactly be prevented. You know, I think this is the part where we, and as a psychiatrist, we have to, you know, work with people a lot to help people understand that trauma and traumatic events can't necessarily be prevented. You can't predict the future. None of us can. We don't know what's going to happen at any given time. I don't think anyone, most people did not see COVID-19 coming the way that it did. And so it's incredibly difficult to make these you know, predictions. But one thing that we can do that has been shown without a doubt that I think Jana just touched on, that is something that is absolutely been found to be the most critical factor in helping people cope with trauma is providing support afterwards. And that is something that is always within our control. So whether it's us supporting others or it's other supporting I us, or it's us I've gone all of the supporting feeds. ourselves. Yeah, I'm doing a screen, um, a screen capture. Uh, hey, Bobby, Zoom hear you. hey, Bobby, you're not on <laughs> mute. Bobby, we can hear you. All right, there we go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so whether it's us supporting one another or whether it's us supporting ourselves, um, which is also a real thing um, involving the practices of gr self gratitude and self forgiveness and self compassion and self love, which are the four often referred to as the four pillars, which are the tenets of almost every ancient religion that we know of, including Buddhism, Hinduism, and the ancient Abrahamic religions. We know that support is critical following stress, and every culture has their different way of doing it. Western culture, our culture for the most part, is one of the only cultures that rejects people for being traumatized or makes it feel like it's their fault, which is literally facilitating a re-traumatization over and over and over again. And so really when it comes down to thinking about what we can do to combat this problem, it's not a big lift. It's not like a, it's a, it's actually a relatively low hanging fruit for us because the service of providing support to another one, another person who's struggling is the same service that we would want back and it's free. When we're, and we want that when we're struggling. And so I think taking that this time and any time that we're struggling, 
you know, or stressed out to reflect on the fact that providing support, which, you know, breaking that down is really just listening without waiting to speak, just genuine empathic listening, where you're really just taking in what somebody's saying, you're making eye contact, you're giving them your full as much undivided attention as possible without waiting to respond, but really just being present with what they're saying. That is all that it takes to really provide adequate support to a loved one or even a stranger at a difficult time. And that's what most of my clients actually pay me for as a psychiatrist and a therapist. But being in my role, I recognize that this is a skill that while I can do it very well, because I've been trained to do it for a long time, it's actually something that is innate to all of us as being human, this support, this love and care. Um, and so I think that understanding that you know, there are certain things that we can't prevent, like the trauma itself, but we actually have a lot of control afterwards. And that is the time to focus on really giving our, each other the support and the healing opportunities to allow us to recover and have the best shot that we can at, you know, not letting the trauma define our lives, but actually growing from it as a challenge that makes us better. I, I have to say, um, you know, a cultural shift is something I agree with you. It, it's it's hard. It's kind of like one person at a time talking about this and giving that information like a ripple in a pond. The culture starts to shift a little bit, and we can support each other better. So I can definitely see how that can be um, more helpful. Um, Nurse Janet, do you have something that you'd like to add to the discussion? Um, yes, absolutely. And I absolutely agree with Dr. Dave that you know being there to support others is so important. Um, when they're going through trauma or, or post-trauma. Uh, you know, one of my biggest cohorts that I work with as patient population are other parents of children with autism. And oftentimes they're going through something similar to what brought us to cannabis, which was my daughter's puberty crisis. It's common to about half of kids with autism. And so a lot of times these families are coming to me in crisis and in the midst of trauma. And, uh, and, and I find that, that educating them, not only about the cannabis, which can be such an answer in that situation, but also educating them about, um, you know, others who have been through similar scenarios, myself included, and, and the trauma and the, the post-traumatic growth that can come from that. And I really just encourage these parents, you know, first of all, let's, let's back you away from that cliff so you can, you can think a little more clearly and you're a little more receptive to the education first and foremost, because that... When people are in the midst of trauma, as you know, Dr. Dave, sometimes they're just not receptive to answers or solutions. So get them through it first, and then when they're receptive, help, helping them find a purpose in that trauma, helping them focus on resources that help promote post-traumatic growth. I think that is, is huge. And, and you know, I share that personally, I am just so blessed to be utilizing the knowledge I gained through my daughters and my traumatic experiences to help others, because that has been probably the most healing influence of my life. So. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's a big theme right now with everything going on as well. And I think if we can just support one another and, and help people understand that there are answers out there, whether it be cannabis or EMDR, or other forms of, of therapy, um, and, that, and that those of us that have been through it and have overcome it are also here to support. Great answer. Um, I think, you know, what you're both touching on is that your health professionals who are willing to stop and listen and look someone in the eye and let them know that you understand and that you're there. So maybe part of this is training for health professionals so that they are not, uh, I know as a patient with PTSD, I've had doctors who sometimes have shut me down. They don't want me to talk about uh, the, you know, what I'm going through. And so, um, so I love it that you're both available and present and listening to, to patients. Dr. Clifton, would you like to add to the conversation about this? Yeah, the research on cannabis and its use around uh, trauma, both in the, uh, the the development of new memory and the management of intrusive uh, flashbacks or nightmares, bad memories that have been placed. You know, we've tried a number of different ways to try to enhance trauma therapy because people who have ongoing uh, PTSD, high, high levels of anxiety and trauma, you know, tend to have their cortisol levels completely off balance. You would think that if they were under a high level of anxiety, that their cortisol levels would actually be high in response to that anxiety. But over time, their cortisol levels actually deplete and they don't have the same response with their cortisol when they go into an acute phase of anxiety or trauma because 
they're constantly, you know, depleted. So we've tried giving people cortisol before therapy to try to enhance trauma therapies and haven't really gotten anywhere. Really out of everything that has been studied to make therapy more effective, the most effective product to do that is cannabis. It's actually the only product that has ever been studied that's shown to improve the effect of, uh, of therapy to, uh, to help with uh, PTSD. So cannabis is not only valuable for people who are dealing with uh, intrusive thoughts in the form of flashbacks during the day and nightmares at night and ongoing anxiety that's leading to some social isolation. There's effectiveness there, but there's also effectiveness in, uh, in, in making sure that the trauma therapy is, 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 moves along at, at, a, at a good pace. And I think also as we go through everything that we're going through now, I mean, we've all been through trauma, but we are all now going through a global trauma and all of us are putting down a lot of memories that, uh, that we can associate all kinds of emotions with, you know, in the amygdala, in the basal part of our brains, and also in the prefrontal cortex where we attach emotion to experiences. Both of those places are richly uh, 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 CB1 receptor, uh, 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 CB1 receptors are found richly in both of those regions of the brain. So by using cannabinoid formulations, I believe that we can also help to lay down healthy memories as stable as possible as we all go through the trauma that we're going through now. I think it is so uniquely situated to help people imagine that we're all fingers on one hand. Because I think you can vacillate in the midst of what we're going through between like, I need to take care of me and my family. And that's all I can think about right now. That's the best I can do. But then none of us can do that. If we're going to get through this together, we all have to work together. We all have to wear our face coverings. We all have to practice the social. We all have to work together in order to get to the other side of this and get things uh, back on track and not being able to do that not being able to see that community uh, is going to is going to be a problem for us so I think the cannabinoid formulations are so powerful for helping people to see the uh, the community and the relationship that we're all in as a as a global citizenry yeah. I love that. It's so true. Um, I, you, we've mentioned cannabis uh, several times here with regard to trauma. Um, Dr. Dave, I, I wanted to let you chime in a little bit about um, your Apollo neuroscience because that's kind of a, could be an ad, another treatment modality to help with uh, the results of, of trauma. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that going off of what Mary and Jenna were saying and what you were saying, I think that there's an incredible amount of hope in the treatment of trauma that we have now uh, discovered, particularly over the last 15 years towards getting people to act closer to a cure or treatment at the root. So cannabis and cannabis, CBD, can hemp derived cannabis products are great for this. And there's a lot of evidence to support them. Um, there, it is not the only uh, medication or or medicine that assists in, in uh, psychotherapy though. And there's a lot of evidence, um, probably an almost equal amount of evidence for, and if not more evidence in um, clinical trials with the FDA for MDMA and ketamine. Um, ketamine and MDMA have both been used since, not as long as cannabis obviously, but they've been used and, and used in clinical trials safely since um, probably ketamine in the 1950s and it's used in children regularly. Um, for putting uh, gently anesthetizing children for surgery. It's incredible uh, for treatment resistant depression and PTSD and has been um, actually FDA approved for depression and is now in trials for PTSD. Um, similarly, MDMA is actually the current best treatment on the horizon that we have to assist psychotherapy with PTSD. The problem with these techniques is as powerful as they are, unlike cannabis, and I think Mary and Jenna were alluding to this, cannabis is so beautiful of a medicine because it can be used on its own. And you don't need a therapist to administer cannabis to you. Um, you do, on the other hand, need a therapist or a doctor to administer MDMA or ketamine or psilocybin to you. And it has to be done in a very carefully curated, um, you know, set and setting and, and environment. Um, so, but the point is that there's lots of options out there that are on the horizon. Ketamine and cannabis are available right now. MDMA is probably going to be like 2022 it will be available, but the results from 
the FDA phase three clinical trial that is currently in play um, is unparalleled. I mean, we're seeing people who have had PTSD that's been treatment resistant for on average over 17 years. And these people have never had relief with any gold standard treatment in over 17 years. And two months after, speaking of teaching people to heal themselves, two months after um, 52% roughly of people who have gone through the MDMA treatment with just three doses of medicine and 12 weeks of psychotherapy are 52% are no longer meeting diagnostic criteria for PTSD. What's even more interesting than that is five years out after just three treatments and 12 weeks of therapy, five years out, 67% of people are no longer meeting diagnostic criteria for PTSD. So effectively, these treatments that are on the horizon are literally demonstrating in high level FDA clinical trials, like real clinical trials that cannabis unfortunately has a lot of pushback on for no good reason, but it is uh, harder to do cannabis trials in this way, um, mainly because there's just you know, infinite variants of cannabis, but with MDMA, there's one molecule. So it's a lot easier to study. And so we can see that even that, that in trials, this is literally the paradigm shift that we are seeing in healthcare. The medicine is going from a few doses, predominantly with psychotherapy, that's teaching people to heal themselves rather than for, you know, facilitating dependence on the medicine. So the Apollo technology is segueing to that was interesting because at the University of Pittsburgh, where we developed it, um, the Apollo technology delivers gentle vibrations to the skin to help um, balance the autonomic nervous system, to reduce the stress response, build resilience and help us bounce back from stress, just like deep breathing or meditation exercise. Um, but it works through the touch pathway to the skin and it induces very similar calming effects to what we see with things like cannabis, uh, MDMA and, and ketamine, but you don't actually have to take the medicine and it's not psychedelic. Um, so the reason it's not like there's no hallucinations or any paranormal activity. It's just calm, present mindfulness. And so that is something that is really powerful and interesting because not everybody's a good candidate for medicine, right? Some people are good for, great for cannabis, which works for a lot of people, but not everybody's good with THC. Some people are, not, not everybody's great with ketamine. Some people are, not everybody's great with MDMA, but some people are. So for those people who are particularly vulnerable and struggling, who don't want to take medicine, being able to have a technological um, alternative like Apollo that has no side effects and isn't addictive is a really wonderful opportunity and it's accessible at, at scale. Um, so that's a really exciting um, opportunity that we're actually starting to test in um, large scale clinical trials for PTSD that's showing great, great results. So the message there is hope. There's lots on the horizon that is coming through. It's yes. such a good message. I love everything that you're saying about that, especially, be, you know, and you haven't really brought up all of the Prozac and Paxil and the, and the, uh, you know, all of the other secondary antidepressants that we use and then the antipsychotics that we use as the antidepressants, all of which you just have to take for the rest of your life every single day. And if you miss a dose, you're going to end up with a bunch of side effects. You know, so many great opportunities within these new realms to allow patients to be more in control and take as much as they need. And some days take none and some days take more, but, but to be in charge to manage yourself. And we all know based on all the patient controlled anesthesia data that when you put patients in charge of their own health, they use less medicines almost all the time. So, so it creates a situation where not only is the patient empowered, but they're also uh, dosing themselves less frequently. Right. I love that. All of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, there, are, there is a lot of hope going forward for patients, and, um, and I, I love hearing all this. Um, so in the interest of time, I, I have one more question, and I hope, um, I think Bobby's in the background. I hope we still have time for this last question. Uh, this has been such a rich discussion. Thank you all so much. Um, so my last question is, through the COVID-19 crisis, telehealth has become more widely used. Uh, what are your thoughts about continuing to use telehealth to meet patient needs when the health crisis is over? And I know some of you are, have already, were already using telehealth prior to this uh, crisis that we've been in, but mainstream medicine has kind of embraced it now. Um, so uh, so uh, Nurse Jana, if you'd like to start talking about telehealth and how we can continue to incorporate it into the health system. Of course, of course, and, and telehealth, you know, I'm, I'm probably a little bit biased because telehealth has been my main modality of consulting with patients for about five years, um, and cannabis patients all over the world, and telehealth is what made that possible. 
you know, because when you build in the travel expenses and the time expense and, you know, family trying to pack up a child with autism and bring them to Oregon, a lot of times that's just not a viable solution for them. So I think telehealth is a great model. Um, I think the practitioners have to take extra steps to make sure that we're doing really thorough and comprehensive assessments. Um, I think it's, you know, obviously not ideal for every type of service and in those services that require any kind of hands-on interaction with the patient. Obviously, telehealth is not going to be optimal for that. But, you know, I feel like it's a great way to educate patients and help guide them around cannabis therapy and nutrigenomics and, you know, some of the other holistic modalities that I specialize in. It's worked beautifully. And I think, uh, you know, with COVID and, and all the concerns around having face-to-face -face interaction, it's, it's a great solution. Thank you. Um, Dr. Clifton, what are your thoughts about it? Oh, I've been exclusively telemedical for about five years now. So, I, I mean, I love telemedicine and there's mm -hmm. so many endless applications, especially in the uh, post-COVID world, now that we're looking to try to get, uh, you know, an adequate number of people screened and tested on a regular basis, but also just to keep people out of office spaces. And I think it's, again, not only a patient empowerment issue, but also a respect issue, you know, we uh, this whole idea of bringing patients to the doctor's office, making them sit for an hour and a half in the waiting room, making them sit for another half an hour in their exam room for a 15 minute visit. You know, everybody is busy. I mean, the doctor is busy, of course, but everybody is busy. And that's just not a reasonable way to run the show any longer. So having a telemedicine system where you can be seen in your car or at your desk or, you know, in your home is, is a much more respectful way to uh, handle medicine now. So I, I love it. It's, I, don't, I don't think anybody will ever go back to a brick and mortar at the level we were before. And we shouldn't, you know, we don't, we don't need to. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I was a kid, the doctor came to the house, right, which put the doctor at risk, too. But they knew the family. They, you know, we, the doc, it, was, it was wonderful. And then we went to this other, you know, really money-driven system, actually. <laughs> Insurance driven, very insurance focused. And you know, they say that if you're bringing somebody in your office and they can walk in and jump up on the exam table and they're, you know, 40 and under, you, putting a stethoscope on their chest is largely a waste of your time. And we just need to embrace that and give people an opportunity to get the things that they need in really easy ways, you know pap smears once every three to five years for most women. There's just a lot of ways to streamline healthcare and save a lot of money, you know. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Dave, what are your thoughts? I mean, I couldn't agree more with what's been said. I think that, you know, telemedicine is the future. Mental health pioneered it because it's the easiest to provide over the internet. It does, as as was, as I think Janice said earlier, it does require a little bit more effort on the part of the practitioner because we don't have the benefit of being, you know, in person with someone. Um, which does help us to learn and by observation and communication a little bit more from our patients. So, and our clients, it does require a little bit more effort, but I would say, you know, I've been practicing predominantly telemedicine for the last co uh, couple of years. And I would say that over the last couple of years, um, maybe within a couple months, I felt more comfortable seeing people online or as comfortable seeing people online as I did in person. Um, and I think the biggest part of it is that, that, my clients really like it. You know, my clients find it's easier to make an appointment. It's easier to come in. Sure. They like, they like being in person very much, but you know, when they can, you know, have an easier time getting to their appointments, they have an easier time. They don't, again, no waiting room, right? Like they don't have to worry about exposing themselves to other people who are sick by coming into the office. Um, it just makes the whole process of providing care so much easier. And again, are there certain things that really need to be evaluated and treated in person? Of course. But I think what we're really finding now, similar to office work life, is that, you know, perhaps much of the time we thought we needed to be in person with people, we may not. And maybe that in-person time was actually putting unnecessary and to some extent unreasonable demands on us that was impairing our ability to perform well. Um, so I think the future of medicine is absolutely predominantly virtual and particularly for mental health. And I think we're just going to see more and more of that. Just as an example, uh, I work with Dr. Phil Wilson, who's the founder of Ketamine Assisted Psychotherapy and has been working with uh, the Multidisciplinary Association, uh, Psych Association of Psychedelic Studies since 
I don't know, its founding and um, ha- is an incredible uh, psychiatrist and, and pioneer in the field. And the two of us are able to now, because of the necessity and the impact of trauma in our culture, we're able to deliver ketamine over the internet. So we can do ketamine assisted psychotherapy for depression and PTSD um, for people. And we're focused on frontline healthcare workers because they're you know, one of our major targets mm-hmm. uh, in terms of populations that are really affected by trauma right now, many of them are my colleagues. And just being able to, for them to know that they have somewhere to go where they can get state-of-the-art trauma treatment delivered right to their home in the limited time that they have off. You know, what could be more powerful and empowering than knowing that you have access to something like that? Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Well, we are uh, at the end of our time, but I would love it if each one of you could give uh, your contact information for people watching and listening. Um, Dr. Nurse Janet, if we can start with you on the top right there. Of course, yes, the best way to get a hold of me is through my media kit website, which is janachampagne.com, spelled just like my name, and it, it kind of gives an overview of what I'm doing in the cannabis industry, and there's a contact form on there. Excellent. So hearing from anybody that wants to reach out. Wonderful. And Dr. Clifton? All of my work is at cbdandcannabisinfo.com, and so you can go and look at any uh, videos. I have some work on personal safety and face coverings also there, and then, of course, cannabis, and if you're, um, if there's anything that you need that you don't see there, then just message me, and I'll get uh, a video together for you. It's probably already in the production schedule, but any of the emails from that site come directly to my personal email inbox. Wonderful. And Dr. Dave? Uh, You could find me at my personal website, drdave.io. And then also you could find uh, information about me and Apollo and my work with Apollo Neuroscience at apolloneuro.com. That's A-P-O-L-L-O-N-E-U-R-O.com. And my work with the Board of Medicine is at boardofmedicine.org. And I'm available if you want to chat on Instagram at at Dr. David Rabin or on Twitter at Dave Rabin. Excellent. Thank you so much. And if people are interested in getting in touch with me, um, it's bulldozerhealth.org. Um, I founded the 501c3. Our mission is to educate everyone about all their health options, improve access to health care, including cannabis and alternative health, and inspire people to optimal health. Thank you all so much for joining me today and the walk Thank for you. Ch- Thank you. Take care. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye.